Now it's time to be naughty. Bayonetta, the fabulous high-energy action game by Hideki Kamiya and Platinum Games, released in 2009 to critical acclaim. Reviewers liked it, gamers absolutely ate it up, and it made a pretty decent chunk of change in its first year, bringing in a whopping 1.3 million copies sold. Which, if you think about it, is really good for a 2009 hack-and-slash video game. All of this success cemented Bayonetta as not only a modern classic, but a truly iconic video game character. Naturally, with such an effortless entrance into the game world, a sequel was bound to happen. After Bayonetta released, Hideki Kamiya and Yusuke Hashimoto began discussing plans for a potential sequel. At the time, Sega would be publishing Bayo 2 just like they did with the first game. In the early stages, things looked pretty good and were progressing smoothly, but about halfway through development, due to mostly unknown reasons, Sega started getting cold feet with Bayonetta 2. At the time, the publisher wanted to scale back on the amount of video games they were putting out yearly, not believing the project was worth Platinum's dev time and their company resources. Resources. The game's funding was pulled, and as a result, Bayo 2's development would be shelved temporarily. With no funding and limited time, Kamiya and Hashimoto started pitching this half-finished Bayonetta 2 to other game publishers. Things started to look very dark for Platinum as publisher after publisher turned down the game. According to Kamiya, at the final hours of Bayonetta 2's almost cancellation, one company would come in to save the day. In a surprise twist of fate, it was Nintendo, the mega video game company mostly known for developing and publishing family-friendly titles. With Nintendo's overwhelming support, Platinum Games was able to restart development on Bayo 2 the way they wanted. With all of that Nintendo money on the line, you'd think such a wholesome company might put some restrictions in place on Bayo 2's over-the-top raunchy content. Well, my friends, you'd be very wrong in thinking that. Having past experience with Platinum on their Wii U exclusive, Wonderful 101, Nintendo producer Hitoshi Yamagami caught wind of Sega dropping Bayo 2 early on. Having really enjoyed working with Platinum on 101, Yamagami approached the developer about collabing on Bayo 2. It wasn't just money and a platform Nintendo was offering, but staff members as well. Bayo 2 would be co-developed by Nintendo exclusively for their Wii U console. I remember at the time, a lot of Bayo 1 fans were pretty upset about this exclusivity deal. The first game was was originally released on 360 and PS3. And yeah, it was really crappy that we had to buy a whole new console just to experience the sequel to one of the most badass action games ever made. To remedy this a bit, Nintendo commissioned Platinum to also port over Bayo 1 to Wii U, bundling both games together for the price of one for a limited time. A pretty sweet deal for returning Bayo fans, but still maybe not what people were looking for for this sequel. Reading up on the game and finding all of this information out for myself back then, I figured without Nintendo, there wouldn't be a Bayonetta 2. So I was reluctantly grateful the game existed in the first place. And yes, I did buy a Wii U for this one game back then, and not much else for it, unfortunately. With this renewed project and legendary studio helping out, Platinum began working on Bayonetta 2 once again. This time in the director's chair was Yusuke Hashimoto, the producer of Bayo 1. Hideki Kamiya took a backseat approach to this title's development, being in the writer's room and overseeing everything as a whole. Akiko Kuroda and Atsushi Inaba would produce the game and work closely with Nintendo. Devil May Cry writer Bingo Morihashi would take on the majority of the scenario writing and story development. Mari Shimazaki would also return in the main character design role and provide some really beautiful redesigns for each of the returning characters. All of the right people were here to make Bayo 2 feel like a worthy successor to that original legendary game. But this time, with Nintendo as support, the title would get that extra polish and shine as bright as platinum. Much like the first game, Bayo 2's goal was to create another innovative hack-and-slash action game that would evolve the action genre and put Bayonetta back on the map. This title wouldn't deviate too heavily from what made its predecessor fantastic, but there was obviously a lot of work going into this project to make it feel like a true continuation to the Bayonetta story and gameplay systems. When coming up with unique features for Nintendo's console, motion and touch controls were added in as well as a plethora of bonus Nintendo character costumes. When 
designing the Nintendo-themed costumes, Platinum's producers worried that maybe Nintendo wouldn't be up for sexualizing Princess Peach, Daisy, or Fox McCloud. So they requested toning down the sexual themes during the design phase. To Platinum's surprise, and probably everyone else's, when reviewing Bayo's Nintendo costumes, Nintendo actually recommended making the design sexier to fit Bayonetta's striking personality. You just never know what to expect, boys and girls. Another idea with each Nintendo costume was to include unique gameplay features to spruce up Bayonetta's basic abilities. The Samus outfit alters Bayo's guns and gives her a legit morph ball transformation, Link comes with a Master Sword that replaces Bayo's katana, and the Peach and Daisy outfits would get Bowser Wicked Weave attacks, which was also something Platinum was worried about. The idea of literally depicting Bowser killing angels in this gory adult action game was something Platinum thought was cool, but Nintendo would never go for. When pitching this particular idea, Nintendo was completely okay with it. I thought it was really important to tell these two stories, because it shows how unrestrictive Nintendo was in letting Platinum just make the game they wanted to make. Nintendo was actually on board with letting the Bayonetta series feel like a Nintendo game with these new features without making Platinum compromise on their creative vision. So big shoutouts to Nintendo in that regard. Okay, we'll get back into some more specific dev history details later, but I think it's time we get into what's new with Bayonetta 2. Strap in, my beauties. This ride is gonna get wild. So I'm gonna be honest with you guys, Bayonetta 2 isn't that different from the first game besides a few new gameplay features and its overall presentation. Bayo 2 is still a pure stylish hack and slash game, that very familiar gameplay loop of using different melee attacks and firing guns while dodging enemy strikes perfectly is still here and is what's going to get you through this game's endless enemy encounters. Dispatching groups of angel enemies and collecting their halos as currency will net you new abilities and items at your old pal Rodan's shop. All of the same melee skills and gameplay altering accessories from Bayo 1 return, plus a few new trinkets that drastically change how Bayonetta plays. I wish the parry accessory was just part of Bayo's installed moveset, instead of it being tied to an optional accessory that takes up an item slot. It's kinda lame, but it feels like one of those things that's just a holdover design-wise from the first title. As you progress through the story, you'll unlock all new angel-slaying weapons that feel very distinct from one another, and unlike anything from the first Bayo title. The game is split into chapters that can range from exploratory environments with secret missions, or just big-ass boss fights. More advanced combat mechanics from Bayo 1 show up in this game as well, like the crushingly powerful Wicked Weave attacks, which are even more important in this title than they were in the first game, we'll talk about that later, the very liberating dodge offset, which allows you to continue melee combos after a successful perfect dodge also makes its return, Bayonetta's multiple beast forms come back, like Bats Within, which still allow you to panic dodge even after taking a hit, and the very satisfying magical torture attacks also make their bloody return to help spice up the basic hack and slash gameplay. At the end of every mission, you're still graded on your overall performance throughout the chapter, and given a trophy. Before we talk about some deeper elements of gameplay, I'll say right now that this title feels way more forgiving in the mission rating department. Even on some of my worst days where I took a lot of damage or just dished out the worst combos you'll ever see, I was still netting gold ranks at the end of certain chapters. It's kinda crazy compared to Bayo 1. Seeing items like heals, damage buffs, and invincibility not decreasing your mission score was pretty freaking crazy. That was such a big part of the first game's ranking system. It's totally changed here, and maybe for the better? It's definitely more inviting to a new player looking to grasp the game's mechanics in an easier way. Don't get me wrong, it's still quite challenging earning those Platinums and Pure Platinum ranks, often requiring a few replays before getting everything down, but it's so much easier to get higher mission ranks now in general. I think it's fine, honestly. It just feels a bit more enjoyable, while still requiring skill and knowledge of the game's systems. Anyway, let's dive into some of the new gameplay mechanics. A new feature added in the sequel is Bayonetta's magical Umbrin Climax form. Something I always thought was missing from Bayo 1 was an activated Devil Trigger-like state. I always thought it was weird seeing the magic meter being used exclusively for certain abilities and torture attacks, and not for a big form change, like most other hack and slash games. Well, Bayonetta 2 answers the call with Umbrin Climax. This form basically acts as a panic button screen clearer. In this state, all of Bayo's attacks are powered up wicked weaves. That's right, every hit in a combo string is a Wicked Weave. It's insanely powerful. I think Umbrin Climax is great because it gives you this powerful crowd control move and one more ability for the magic system, opening up more options in combat. Now when your magic gauge is full and you're surrounded by a variety of enemies, you can either use a powerful torture attack on a stronger angel, removing them completely, leaving you to focus your normal combos on the weaker enemies left alive. If you're up against a group of basic enemies, you can just pop Umbrin Climax and wipe them all out in seconds. If you have access to multiple magic gauges, you can 
can do both of these things in a single battle. I've heard people criticize this feature for kind of breaking the game's combo flow. I get why people would think this addition would subtract from experimenting with multiple different magical abilities whenever possible. I can see a lot of newcomers falling back on this move when pushed into a corner, or when they're not doing as well in basic combat. Climax is triggered at the push of a single button, so why not hit it whenever you got it? Maybe if there was an alternative activation method, like the Wicked Weave inputs that force players to maybe do a 5 to 10 hit combo while their magic gauge is full to trigger this move, instead of it being a panic button. Something like that might get an inexperienced player to experiment a bit more before being rewarded with utter chaos. With the game's ranking system favoring variety in combat, choosing to torture attack a single enemy, and then finishing off the rest with an Umbran Climax if possible, always seemed like the way to go for me. But not everyone plays like that. For a new player unfamiliar with Bayonetta, what incentivizes someone to choose clearing a screen full of enemies, leaving the stronger ones weaker, over carefully picking off those stronger enemies with torture attacks? To the untrained player, it sure does seem like a one-button solution to most of your problems. Climax is a great new feature and something I always wanted out of the first game, but I kind of wish it was a bit more skill-based to activate, rather than feeling like an insta-win move. With all of that being said, I do like it from a gameplay perspective, and it just feels like Bayonetta's gotten a lot more powerful between the two games. Umbran Climax does contribute to a specific problem with this game's overall combat that I'll talk about in a minute though. The weapons in Bayonetta 1 were pretty cool, but some were completely useless in my opinion. The shotguns and rocket launchers were kinda just there, and took up space for something else that could've been a bit more interesting to play around with. Bayo's sword and whip were my two favorite weapons, and I mainly just stuck to those throughout my playthrough. This isn't the case for Bayonetta 2. Every weapon in this game is good. Bayo starts off with two new pairs of pistols, appropriately named Love is Blue, held in each hand and strapped to her heels. These guns have a similar moveset to her original pistols, but the animations are different, giving them a fresh feel in battle. Bayo's wicked weaves with these blue beauties use the same giant demon punches and kicks from the first title, but in this game we actually get to see the demon attack attached to those attacks. Madama Butterfly. This massive babe is so cool. More on her later. Some of the unlockable tools of destruction you'll be finding are things like the double blades, Rakshasa, which are pretty weak but extremely fast. An added production pair can be used on Bayo's heels, making this quadruple blade system quite deadly if you know what you're doing. The giant hammer, Take Mikazuchi, is a wildly powerful but painfully slow bludgeoner that can absolutely destroy smaller groups of angels with wicked weaves. I don't usually like slow weapons in my action games, but I had a surprising amount of fun with this mallet from hell. Just seeing Bayo charge up giant slams and smashes with this thing was enough to have me use it for far longer than I expected. Salamandra, a pair of demonic chainsaws are one of the more unique sets of weapons. Sporting a slow charged up moveset and no traditional wicked weaves, this thing might take some getting used to. Its basic attacks are pretty effective, but once Umbran Climax is activated is when this thing finally gets wicked weaves, making for some pretty limited but devastating hits in your combos. Strapping them to Bayo's heels gives her a lot of added mobility, allowing you to skate around the environment at some pretty high speeds. It reminded me of Odette, Bayo's ice skates from the previous game. Chernobog is a triple-bladed sentient scythe that can fire its blades like a rifle. This weapon right here might be my favorite based on its concept alone. With Wicked Weaves, its attacks are powerful but not entirely slow or fast. They have a decent amount of wind-up, but are nowhere near as sluggish as the hammer animation set. I'm sure you guys get it by now, but I can talk about each of the weapons in Bayo 2 all day. They're all super unique visually, and how you use them in battle always feels like a treat. Bayonetta 1 had some variety in its weapons, but Bayo 2's weapons shine a lot brighter, in my opinion. There are actually a ton of other weapons too, like a legit chain chomp from Mario. Mamma mia! Kafka, the long-ranged bow that has heat-seeking missile-like wicked weaves, and Bayo's katana, Shuraba, makes its return, which makes me very happy. I love charging up that sword so much. While I love each piece in Bayo's updated arsenal, I will say a major problem this game suffers from is the fact that Bayo only really does effective damage with wicked weaves, torture attacks, or when she's in Witch Time. Bayonetta's basic attacks outside of Witch Time feel super weak compared to how she played in the first title. When I was talking about the weapons, did you notice how I kept bringing up the Wicked Weaves? Unlike Bayo 1, Weaves are basically the only way to hit hard in normal combat. Every weapon is kind of balanced out in their overall damage dealing capabilities. Examining the basic attacks, the Giant Hammer is only marginally better at dealing damage than something like the Double Swords, in which time your attacks feel beefier, and hitting Wicked Weaves 
leaves in this focused state basically means whatever you're fighting is dead or in very bad shape. It kind of feels like the devs wanted people to get better at the more advanced mechanics, like perfect dodges that trigger witch time, but that can also alienate new players or people who just aren't good at dodging. This change in power balancing is restrictive. It means if you want to play well, you mostly have to be in witch time. By the way, when I talked about Umbran Climax contributing to a larger problem, it was this, the lack of damage Bayonetta's normals do against her enemies. I get wanting players to use new mechanics that you develop. I get wanting those new features to feel powerful. But when you give me basic attacks that are by default pretty weak, of course I'm going to use what's effective over potentially struggling with an ineffective basic combo. It doesn't encourage a player to experiment with unlockable moves or things like mixing in torture attacks. I actually watched a friend play this entire game, and to my surprise, she only used the double blades and Umbran Climax when available for her entire playthrough. My friend rarely plays hack and slash games, so it was really interesting seeing her play on normal mode, which can get quite challenging at certain points, and having zero problems with basically everything that was thrown at her. Spamming the same mashy punch combo that led to a wicked weave, slamming that climax button as soon as it appeared, roll credits. It's crazy coming off Bayo 1 and seeing a basic tactic like this absolutely conquer the game. Not a single purchased item or ability was used either. Now admittedly, this concern isn't a problem if you know how Bayonetta 2's damage, Witch Time, and Wicked Weaves function. You can still apply those things to your basic combos in fun and interesting ways, but at the end of the day, it kind of feels like you're just building your magic meter to get that Umbran Climax ability. That crazy move isn't available by exploring the game's combat depth. That's where the problem lies. Do you make it easier to enter god mode for a short amount of time, opening the doors to a casual player who just wants to have fun, or do you risk losing them by setting such a powerful skill behind having to do a combo? This game has a lot of depth, and I enjoy the battles, enemies, and the different weapons a lot. It just feels like there's less incentive to explore the deeper elements of combat. The game's basically saying, here's your super move, have fun. It's an interesting topic that we can talk about all day, but I'll leave it at this. I think Umbran Climax is a great addition, but it's definitely overpowered. Okay, let's move on. On a definite positive note, the enemies you encounter in Bayo 2 are fantastic. All of these guys have attacks that hit hard, hopefully encouraging you to get good at dodging, and are all well placed throughout the story with more difficult and unique types of enemies showing up in the later game. For most of this title, you'll be fighting brand new angels with their own unique attacks and weapons. Just like the first game, you can acquire the limited-use angel weapons from recently defeated enemies. Some angels will now enrage each other, making them more aggressive and unpredictable towards Bayo in combat, which is such a cool addition for the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. No longer are you the only source of an angel's rage. You actually have to plan accordingly and take out specific aggressors to make your battles easier. Some classic Bayo 1 angels and bosses show up in a flashback level, and it was really cool having a full game's worth of new angels to fight than having some of the classics come back in surprise cameo appearances. By the way, the kinships, my least favorite angels from game 1, show up for like 3 seconds and then fuck off to hell. I was so glad they weren't a recurring enemy. Unlike the previous entry, you'll also be fighting the forces of hell this time, and these guys are super cool. Demons are obviously the opposite of angels in their design, and kind of in their gameplay. A lot of demons shapeshift and attack with ranged damage, which is counter to the variety of up-close attacking angels. Once defeated, you can grab devastating demon weapons in the middle of combat. These denizens of hell also drop red and blue orbs, just like in Devil May Cry, which yeah, feeds my personal theory that Bayo and DMC exist in the same universe. Obviously, Kamiya-san made the original DMC, so this is probably just a nod to his first hack and slash epic, but I like to hold on to my personal theory. The demons are visually awesome, and in some cases really scary. There's one in particular which turns Bayo into a child and slowly approaches her with its horrifying maw. You have to desperately run away, waiting for this demonic spell to wear off. Demons aren't just reskins of angels, they have their own crazy moves like the one I just described, and their own behaviors in combat. Light spoilers, but Phantom from DMC1 makes his return, and if you know me, you'll know that Phantom is my favorite DMC boss. Seeing him here with an expanded moveset and baby spiders that throw you off guard was an absolute treat. It's nice seeing how many different types of enemies Platinum was able to cram into this one game. We could have just gotten a few new enemy types along with the guys from Bayo 1 for the whole game, but instead we get a slew of new angels, some classics, and a whole new enemy type in Demons, pushing Platinum's creativity and game design well past where it needed to go and showing us just how much they cared when making this title something really special. With Phantom in mind, let's move on to some of the heavy hitters. Bayo 2's boss 
bosses are all pretty good, but the way some of them are designed feel a little weak and gimmicky. So just like Bayo 1 and the rest of the hack and slash genre, a lot of bosses in this game eventually become normal enemies in the mid to late chapters. There are some light boss rushes towards the end, and of course this wouldn't be Bayonetta without most of these battles being fought against massive angel enemies. One of the first bosses you fight is an enraged version of Bayonetta's own infernal demon, Gamora. This battle is a completely controllable boss fight, but also like a cinematic set piece. You battle this creature while flying through the air with Bayo's newly acquired witch wings. Gamora climbing up buildings, destroying everything in sight, and attacking Bayonetta with a variety of strikes makes this opening battle drop dead gorgeous and so memorable. In this fight, there's like an alternate control style introduced for Bayonetta's flying. The flying movement system took a second to register, but once I got it down, it felt very satisfying realizing that all of Bayo's normal controls and attacks are basically overlaid on top of this movement style. I have a slow light issue with flying, however, and that problem is that the game uses it far too often. There are a lot of bosses in this title, but most of the larger ones use this flying mechanic. After the third or fourth one of these things, I started to get a little fed up with it. There's usually a giant set piece happening in the background, and sometimes if you're fighting a smaller boss, it can be really hard to tell what your adversary is up to with the sheer amount of stuff flying around in the background. I was talking to a friend about this, and he laid it out perfectly. The flying set pieces are sort of a cheap way to build up hype. In the first game, all of the bosses were grounded for the most part, some of them even feeling like movement and positioning puzzles with environmental hazards. In Bayonetta 2, when a hype moment is happening in the story, you can bet your sweet ass there's probably going to be some flying when the gameplay starts. Oh no, look, they're in the water. There's no gravity. That means flying. Obviously, in the grand scheme of things, this is a small complaint that I feel like I have to voice just because I mostly love this game for everything that it does. I would have loved it if the flying sections were cut down a bit, but for every flying boss fight, there were absolutely amazing ones like Lady Alruna, whose double whips are like my favorite thing ever, and of course the mysterious Masked Lumen. Whenever that guy showed up, an incredible fight was sure to follow. A very big DMC3 vibes from that guy. That's kinda it for the boss talk. There's not a lot of super creative things being done with the bosses. It's all pretty basic, but not in a bad way. It's all really good, just not insanely mind-blowing. Well, except for the kaiju battle. I don't know how I almost forgot to mention that. It's actually amazing. Being able to control Madama Butterfly, like fighting a massive angel the size of a skyscraper. You know what I'm gonna say, the definition of hype. I like the level design in Bayo 2 more than the first game. There's less of that Bayo 1 gimmicky design, like having to jump on moving cars, doing an admittedly cool motorcycle set piece that maybe overstayed its welcome, and the extremely long and sometimes barf-inducing on-rails shooter section. There is actually another on-rails shooter level in Bayo 2, but it feels way more polished. Yeah, the camera no longer 360s when you do a dodge. Like, why did they think that was a good idea? I almost lost my lunch. There is also a substitute for the motorcycle level in Bayo 2, and that's the demonic horseback riding in Hell, which also doesn't overstay its welcome and is capped off with a pretty great boss fight. There's a good amount of on-foot exploratory level design to keep you finding items, weapon parts, and secret missions. By the way, secret missions? nowhere near as challenging as they were in Bayo 1. Some might see this as a negative, I kinda like them being simpler. They're just a quick diversion that gives me a permanent upgrade and reminds me to use some of the deeper elements of Bayo's ability set. Like I said before, there are chapters that are just boss fights that punctuate key events in the story. Much like the first game, these events are welcome breaks from exploring and fighting lesser enemies all day. And yeah, flying aside, it's always really fun seeing Bayonetta style on these gigantic nightmare angels and demons like it's nothing. There are a lot more underwater areas now to accommodate Bayonetta's new snake form. Snake Within helps you clear huge underwater distances in seconds. You never know what you might find down there. There's also a level where you pilot a magical Umbran witch mecha and stomp out waves of angel enemies in a very snappy gauntlet style chapter. This game is just incredibly well paced, and yeah, there's not much more I can add to it. I guess I could just sing its praises some more, but let's move on to our final new and unexpected gameplay feature. That being Tag Climax. Yes, Bayonetta 2 has an actual co-op mode. This ain't no DMC3 plug in a second controller to play as Dante's doppelganger. No, this is a legit online bloody palace. 
Tag Climax can be played online or offline with a partner bot. In Tag Climax, you choose six battles to partake in and customize your character's costume and loadout. Each player only gets one set of weapons. Honestly, Tag Climax is really fun when you play online with someone you know. You can do crazy shit in this mode, like launch an enemy and then have a friend air combo them. The combo potential is huge. The problem is, this is an online mode for a high-octane hack-and-slash game. An online mode for a very niche genre of video game that requires a lot of skill to get into. If you don't know where I'm going with this, it means no one is playing anymore. Well, except for this one player named Oro, who has a full S plus ranking on their profile. I hope whoever Oro is, they find who they're looking for. Bayonetta fans love you, Oro. Thank you for keeping the dream alive. In all seriousness, Tag Climax is an amazing idea. It's just Bayonetta combat in co-op, which is like a dream come true. By the way, this game does have unlockable characters, so you don't have to play as two Bayo clones in co-op. You can unlock Jean after finishing the game, Rodan, and two other spoiler characters who I'll talk about in a bit. Oh yeah, you can also play as the legendary Cutie J, the Platinum Knight, who valiantly defends the weak and innocent from the forces of heaven and hell. Look out, all evildoers across the world, Cutie J is here. Before you ask, yes, I was so inspired by this righteous do-gooder. I am now Cutie S. Bayo 2's gameplay is more of that good old platinum design and polish, just way more forgiving. I don't think this title innovates as much on the action game genre as the first Bayo did, but it's still so much fun to play. Believe it or not, but a lot of hardcore action fans kinda don't like this game. And I know a lot of you hack and slash players are gonna watch this video. So look guys, I know you probably think I'm being too nice to this game, but I don't want to parrot your opinions to make you feel special, or feel like I have to check a point off some imaginary gamer cred application. I just kind of like the game a lot. It does have problems that we've gone into, it being a lot easier and very gracious with its ranking system, Bayo having to rely too heavily on Witch Time, and Umbran Climax feels hella overpowered. As an overall package though, including the story and presentation with that gameplay, I think I like this one more than the first game. I hope some of the hardcore players out there can respect my opinion on this, because I respect and appreciate everyone else's. Now that we've got that pesky gameplay out of the way, Let's talk about that story. At least your lot still knows how to make an end. Bayo 2's story takes place shortly after the events of our previous adventure. Bayonetta, or Cereza, is out living her best life with her partner in crime, Jean. After a very bougie New York shopping spree is interrupted by God's holy messengers, Bayonetta and Jean are forced to defend themselves. During this intense battle, one of Bayonetta's own infernal demons loses control and lunges towards her. Jean pushes Bayo out of the way, but in the process has her body and soul separated from one another. Jean's spirit is dragged down to hell, and after putting her bad dog in its place, Bayonetta's mission is to find her way into the beating heart of the underworld and rescue her partner before it's too late. Bayonetta 2 is a much more personal story for our leading lady, and it focuses on her journey in saving Jean and learning even more about her forgotten past. Most of the characters from the first game come back, some have expanded roles, some are left to the wayside. The story is still told through full motion cutscenes and slideshows respectively, just like the first game. I'm gonna talk major character spoilers at one point, but I'll do my best at leaving specific endgame details out, as to not ruin the game if you decide to play it. 
Okay, let's take a look at each character. A lot of the ideas from Game 1 are flipped on their head in Bayo 2. Like, Jean in the first game was this sort of pursuer rival character for most of that title's runtime. You never knew what she was up to, but when it's finally revealed that she's also one of the last surviving Umbran witches, it gives Bayo a reason to not only trust her, but team up for the ending, and eventually live together. As hetero life partners, of course. Taking that rivalry and making Jean one of Bayo's best friends, and the goal of this sequel is just perfect. Jean was my favorite character in the first game, so seeing her be the story's focus and a device to strengthen Bayo's character depth was really cool. Even though she's out of commission for most of the game, Jean still gets a few great character moments to show off how badass she is. Jean and Bayonetta are like two gaudy Broadway lesbians. You know what I'm talking about. Two women that you always see shopping together, going to the theater, and walking their dog together in Central Park. They might not have a lot of visible romantic energy, but then you find out they've been married for like 40 years and just never talk about it. Basically your double income, no kids, lesbian aunts that just want to enjoy the finer things in life. Um, what was I talking about again? Oh yeah, uh, I also love how Bayo and Jean basically switched hairstyles in this game. That's what couples do sometimes, you know? The supporting trio of Bayonetta bros, Enzo, Rodan, and Luca, also make their return, but in very limited appearances. Enzo is exactly the same type of guy he was in that first game, a sleazy, shot-calling informant, now doubling as a pack mule for Bayonetta's shopping ventures. Rodan is as badass as ever. He still owns the gates of hell, but also helps in watching over Jean's body while Bayo's out looking for her soul. There's an amazing set piece where you get to fight alongside Rodan in hell, and he is unstoppable. He one-shots basically everything. It's so sick. Luca's role is very reduced in this game. He shows up near the start and towards the end, once again playing babysitter for a new child character named Loki. Luca is basically a cameo appearance in this game. His actions have very little consequence on the overall story, but it was still good to see him show up. One big negative about Luca in this game is that his design, I feel, isn't very good. He's like a cool desperado, but he isn't cool, so his look kind of clashes with his cuckoo personality. Loki, our new mysterious player, contributes to a major part in this story. He's kind of annoying at first, like most kid characters tend to be, but he definitely grew on me as I saw more of the story play out. Like Cereza and Bayonetta in the first game, Loki is a character out of time. He has extraordinary cosmic powers and is seemingly being hunted by the angels Bayo is always fighting against. He's also got a pretty foggy memory in terms of where he comes from. Loki and Bayonetta have a fairly rocky start to their partnership throughout the game, but Bayo always looks after and protects him as more and more enemies show up to take him down. To talk about Loki would spoil some major surprises in the story, so I'm gonna leave it there for now. Can I gush about some specific things this game does before we get into spoilers? I love how the worlds of heaven and hell in this universe have so many interesting demonic and angel characters. Like I mentioned at the start, Bayonetta's massive femme fatale demon friend, Madama Butterfly, is so cool. She's a giant kaiju woman who never says anything, but whose presence and personality is so clearly defined and felt whenever she appears. She's so savage, she sword fucks angels to death like it's nothing. That might be one of the best kill animations in gaming history. My favorite boss, Alruna, has an unspoken rivalry with Miss Butterfly. When I first got to this boss fight, I realized no matter how much screen time a character gets in a Kamiya game, everyone always has a unique personality. It makes the world feel very three-dimensional. Like, these aren't just throwaway characters. Between QDJ, Butterfly, the Kaiju battle, and Alruna, this title has so much tokusatsu energy. I love the traditional Japanese superhero and villain aesthetic this game is constantly going for. It adds to Bayonetta's already amazing visual flair. Okay, I'm gonna get into some spoiler characters right now, so skip to the time on screen if you'd like to avoid big story reveals. So at the end of Bayo 1, we discover Father Balder, Bayo's actual dad. His goal was to collect and activate the eyes of the world to basically reset existence. In Bayonetta 2, Balder comes back as the masked Lumen, but this time he's a lot younger and, dare I say, a bit more virtuous. This version of Balder has been plucked out of the past and is looking for the killer of his recently deceased lover, Rosa, Bayonetta's mother. After a few key events that I won't mention, Balder kind of comes to his senses and helps Bayo on her journey. All the while, 
Bayo isn't telling him who she is. Once again, this is very similar to Jean's role from Bayo 1, just flipped. I love when we get multiple sides to a story, where we actually get to sympathize with a shady character and see things from their perspective. The on-rails shooter section of this game sees Balder and Bayo fighting together. It's really cool. The other spoiler I wanted to talk about is Bayonetta's trip to the past, where she partakes in the Great Umbran Lumen War, and fights alongside her mother, Rosa. Rosa is super powerful, and is also voiced by Bayonetta's actress, Helena Taylor. Taylor does an amazing job at separating these two characters, basically doing her Bayo voice at a lower register, and speaking in a more Shakespearean manner. I love how hype this game gets with the amount of moments where we get to fight alongside the other characters. The time travel scene mimics the opening of Bayo 1, where in that game, Bayo and Jean were battling angels in the past on a fallen clock tower. Here, Bayo and Rosa are doing the same thing in a different place at the same time as the intro from Bayonetta 1 also plays out. It's so fucking cool. By the way, Balder and Rosa are also playable. Rosa in the main campaign and Balder in Tag Climax. Those were those two spoiler characters I mentioned earlier. I'm sure you guys can see why I mentioned this story being a hell of a lot more personal for Bayo. She starts her initial journey not knowing anything about her past. Everything's slowly revealed to her with Cereza and Jean. Here in Bayo 2, she gets to meet the good side of her father, and her mother who was taken from her all those years ago. Bayonetta had an incredible amount of confidence in the first game purely based off of her not remembering anything. As she learns more about herself, she goes from a bulletproof angel slayer, unfazed by anything, to a caring, more humanized, relatable protagonist. It's worth mentioning the guy who wrote this game's story, Bingo Morihashi, has a lot of experience with writing really fun and heartfelt stories for hack and slash games. Bayonetta going through some family drama calls back to DMC 3, 4, and the recently released 5, which are all games that Bingo worked on. Bayonetta meeting her mother, Rosa, this mythical background character, always felt like Dante meeting Sparta to me. Helena Taylor gets a lot to play around with in this story. How Bayonetta reacts to finally saving Jean, and how she crushingly says goodbye to her parents once again. Seeing Bayonetta actually get emotional over her friends and family is heartbreaking, but also the perfect progression for this character. Bayo is still as powerful and as confident as ever, but now we get to see more of her human side, helping shape her as more of a three-dimensional character. Bayonetta 2's story is really great, but there's something else that's been massively upgraded with this title. That, my friends, is the presentation. The Nordic-inspired city of Noatun is so beautiful. Based on Norse mythology and a mix of Italian and Belgian architecture, this vast coastal city is a giant improvement over the cramped, rustic locales of Vigrid. That full-on gold and brown aesthetic from Bayo 1 is no longer present. It's very apparent that this game was designed with color in mind. Every single environment has a wide range of bright colors that makes every level stand out. Like the first game, there are still a lot of angelic golden environments, but everything looks way less desaturated in general. I loved exploring the very blue-tinted hell levels that got progressively grosser as they went along. The demon garden aesthetic of hell really spoke to my goth gamer heart. It's funny seeing how when you place the Bayo 1 character model in this game's environments, that outfit's real colors finally shine through. Here I thought the outfit from Bayo 1 was pure black, but it's actually like navy blue. The cutscenes were once again directed and choreographed by Yuji Shimomura, using silly previs to block out every shot and then animating to that footage. Every action scene looks very cinematic this time, from the camera's position to how the characters move around in the scene. It's a big improvement, and the amount of cool gun pointing poses that bookend certain cutscenes is just fantastic. The music in this game is also incredible, with all new original tracks like the amazing battle theme Tomorrow Is Mine, and the new theme song a dazzling remix of Moon River. If you thought Fly Me To The Moon from the first game was catchy, Moon River will almost be impossible to get out of your head. The Platinum Sound Team really killed it with this title's fantastic original soundtrack. Bayonetta 2 is a great video game, and an experience that shouldn't be missed. I'm so happy Kamiya and Hashimoto never gave up pitching this idea when Sega was done with it. I'm equally as thankful to Nintendo for not letting this wonderful game end Bayonetta die, like it most likely would have without their intervention. Bayo 2 is a game that has problems, but does so much right. It's a game that probably shouldn't exist. To this day, the gap between the two Bayo titles was so long that when I finally played it, I felt like I was experiencing some alternate reality miracle sequel to that zany little action game that I really liked. Nintendo coming in and cementing Bayonetta as one of their characters that they care about feels so wrong but also very right. No matter what anyone says, I will always love this game, and be grateful that Nintendo let Platinum make the sequel they wanted. If you want to play Bayonetta 2, you can get it on Wii U or Switch. 
Obviously, the Switch version is great because you can take your witchy adventures on the go. Before we close out today's video, we have to talk about something. Back in 2017 at the Game Awards, Bayonetta 3 was announced. We got to see a very vague teaser trailer of Bayonetta fighting something. She looks a little battle damaged and very distressed with whatever she's up against. The trailer ends with her falling, split in half. What is this? What's going on? Well, nobody knows because there hasn't been any meaningful news since this teaser trailer was shown. Hideki Kamiya has commented on this with very vague info about the game's development, saying things like they're taking their time and for the fans to forget about the game until another big announcement is made. While this type of info might seem dire, I think it's good. I don't believe the game is in development hell. I think Platinum is just taking their time since they make so many games all at once. I guess only time will tell as to the state of Bayo 3 and what it even is. But for now, the wait continues. And while you're waiting, why not check out Bayonetta 2, the miracle sequel? Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Sorry I've been away for so long. Things have been pretty rough recently. I've been very busy. Nothing to worry about though. I have to give some shout outs to some sweet people before I go today. Huge shout to one of my favorite artists, Lisa, aka Liz Art, who drew Susie Netta 2 for this video. I'm absolutely blown away by these new paintings. Thank you so much, Lisa. Everyone's links will be down in the description, please check them out. If you guys like this video, please consider subscribing and checking out my Patreon in the description box down below. Okay everyone, I'll talk to you all very soon. I'll be vacationing in a village. Later.